Hey guys, this is Josh and welcome back to the channel. We are going over our history and we are continuing with the series on Paul Kruger, the 1890s. In mid-March 1890, Kruger met the new British High Commissioner and Governor Sir Henry Brougham Locke, Locke's legal advisor William Philip Schreiner and Rhodes who had by now attained a dominant position in the Transvaal's mining industry and a royal charter for his British South African company to accompany and administer Matabili land and Mashona land. A group of Transvaalers planned to immigrate to Mashona land, the so-called Baula track, and Rhodes was keen to stop this lest it interfere with his own plans. He and Locke offered to support Kruger in his plan to acquire a port at Cozy Bay and link it to the Transvaal through Swaziland if in return the Transvaal would enter a South African customs union and pledge not to expand northwards. Kruger made no commitments, thinking this union might easily turn into the federation Britain had pursued years before, but on his return to Pretoria forbade any boer trek to Mashona land. Rhodes became Prime Minister of the Cape Colony in July 1890. A month later, the British and the Transvaalers agreed on a joint control over Swaziland. Without consulting the Swazis, the South African Republic could build a railway through it to Cozy Bay, on the condition that the Transvaal thereafter supported the interests of Rhodes Chartered Company in Matibili Land and its environs. Kruger honoured the latter commitment in 1891, when he outlawed the Adendorf Trek another would-be emigration to Mashonaland over the protests of Ubar and many others. This, along with his handling of the economy and the civil service, now widely perceived as overloaded with Dutch imports, caused opposition to grow. The industrial monopolies Kruger's administration granted became widely derided as corrupt and inefficient, especially the dynamite concession given to Eduard Lippert and a French consortium, which Kruger was forced to revoke in 1892, amid much scandal over misrepresentation and price gouging. Kruger's second Volksrat sat for the first time in 1891. A resolution, any resolution it passed, had to be ratified by the first Volksrat. Its role was in effect largely advisory. Eitlander could vote in elections for the second Volksrat after two years residency on the condition they were naturalized as burgers, a process requiring the renunciation of any foreign allegiance. The residency qualification for naturalized burgers to join the, the first Volksrat electorate was raised from 5 to 14 years, with the added criterion that they had to be at least 40 years old. During the close run campaign, for the 1893 election, in which Kruger was again challenged by Hubert with the Chief Justice John Gilbert Kotzer as a third candidate. The President indicated that he was prepared to lower the 14-year residency requirement, so long as it would not risk the subversion of the state's independence. The electoral result was announced as 7,854 votes for Kruger, 7,009 for Hubert, and 81 for Kotza. Hubert's supporters alleged procedural irregularities and demanded a recount. The ballots were counted twice more, although the results varied slightly each time. Every count gave Kruger a majority. Hubert conceded and Kruger was inaugurated for the third time on the 12th of May 1893. Kruger was by this time widely perceived as a personification of Afrikanerdom both at home and abroad. When he stopped going to the government's office at the Ratsal by foot and began to be conveyed there by a presidential carriage, his coming and going became a public spectacle not unlike the changing of the guard in Britain. Once seen, he is not easily forgotten, wrote Lady Phillips. His greasy frock coat and antiquated tail hat have been portrayed times without number and I think his character is clearly to be read in his face, strength of character and cunning. Rising tensions, raiders, 
and reformers. By 1894, the Cozy Bay scheme had been abandoned and the Dalgoa Bay line was almost complete. The railways from Natal and Cape had reached Johannesburg. Chief Malabuch's insurgency in the north compelled Hubert to call up a commando and the state artillery in May 1894. Those drafted included British subjects, the large majority of whom indignantly refused to report, feeling that as foreigners they should be exempted. Kotz's ruling that British nationality did not preclude one from conscription as a Transvaal resident prompted an outpouring of displeasure from the Eightlanders that manifested itself when Loch visited Pretoria the following month. Protesters waited for Kruger and Lock to enter the presidential coach at the railway station, then unharnessed the horses, attached a union jack and raucously dragged the carriage to Lock's hotel. Embarrassed, Lock complied with Kruger's request that he should not go on to Johannesburg. Kruger's announcement that the government will, in the meantime, provisionally no more commandeer British subjects for personal military service. In his memoirs, he alleged that Locks secretly conferred with the Eightlanders National Union at this time about how long the miners could hold Johannesburg by arms without British help. The following year, the National Union sent Kruger a petition bearing 38,500 signatures requesting electoral reform. Kruger dismissed all such entreaties, assertion that enfranchising these newcomers, these disobedient persons, might imperil the Republic's independence. Protest, he shouted at one Eightlander deputation. What is the use of protesting? I have the guns, you haven't. The Johannesburg press became intensely hostile to the president personally, using the term Krugerism to encapsulate all the Republic's perceived injustices. In August 1895, after gauging Burgess views from across the country, the Volksrat rejected the opposition's bill to give the Eightlanders the vote by 14 ballots to 10. Kruger said this did not extend to those who had proved their trustworthiness and conferred Burger rights to all Eightlanders who served in the Transvaal commandos. The Dalgoa Bay Railway Line was completed in December 1894, the realization of a great personal ambition of Kruger, who tightened the final bolt of our national railway personally. The formal opening in July 1895 was a gala affair with leading figures from all the neighboring territories present, including Locke's assessor, Sir Hercules Robinson. This railway changed the whole internal situation in the Transvaal. Kruger wrote in his autobiography, Until that time, the Cape Railway had enjoyed a monopoly, so to speak, of the Johannesburg traffic. Difference of opinion between Kruger and Rhodes over the distribution of the profits from customs duties led to the Drifts Crisis of September-October 1895. The Cape Colony avoided the Transvaal railway fees by using wagons instead. Kruger's closure of the drifts, or fords, in the Far River, where the wagons crossed, prompted Rhodes to call for support from Britain on the grounds that London Convention was being breached. The Colonial Secretary, Joseph Chamberlain, told Kruger if he did not reopen the drifts, Britain would do so by force. Kruger backed down. Understanding that renewed hostilities with Britain were now a real possibility, Kruger began to pursue armament. Relations with Germany had been warming for some time when Lloyds went there for medical treatment in late 1895. He took with him an order from the Transvaal government for rifles and munitions. Conferring with the colonial office, Rhodes pondered the coordination of an Eightlander revolt in Johannesburg with British military intervention and had a force of about 500 marshaled on the Bechuana land, Transvaal frontier, under Leander Star Jamison, the chartered company's administrator of Matabeleland. 
On the 29th of December 1895, ostensibly following an urgent plea from the Johannesburg Reform Committee, as the National Union now called itself, these troops crossed the border and rode for the Witwatersrand. The Jamison Raid had begun. Jamison's force failed to cut all of the telegraph wires, allowing a rural transfer office to raise the alarm early, though there are suggestions Kruger had been tipped off some days before. Dubert called up the burghers and rode west to meet Jamison. Robinson publicly repudiated Jamison's actions and ordered him back, but Jamison ignored him and pushed on towards Johannesburg. Robinson wild wired Kruger offering to come immediately for talks. The reform committee's efforts to rally the eight landers for revolt floundered, partly because not all of the mine owners or landlords were supportive, and by the 31st of December the conspirators had raised a makeshift feed clear over their headquarters at the offices of Rhodes Goldfields Company, signaling their capitulation. Unaware of this, Jamison continued until he was forced to surrender by Pitt Cronier on the 2nd of January 1896. A congratulatory telegram to Creer from Kaiser Wilhelm II on the 3rd of January prompted a storm of anti-Boer and anti-German feeling in Britain, with Jamison being lionized as a result. Kruger shouted down talk of the death penalty for the imprisoned Jamison or a campaign of retribution against Johannesburg, challenging his more bellicose commandants to depose him if they disagreed and accepted Robinson's proposed mediation with alacrity. After confiscating the weapons and munitions the reform committee had stockpiled, Kruger handed Jamison and his troops over to British custody and granted amnesty to all the Johannesburg conspirators except for 64 leading members who were charged with high treason. The four main leaders, Lionel Phillips, John Hayes Hammond, George Frara and Frank Rhodes, the brother of Cecil, pleaded guilty in April 1896 and were sentenced to hang. But Kruger quickly had thus commuted to fines of £25,000 each. Resurgence. The Jamison raid ruined Rhodes's political reputation in the Cape and lost him his long-standing support for the Africana bond. He resigned as Prime Minister of the Cape Colony on the 12th of January. Kruger's handling of the affair made his name a household word across the world and won him much support from Afrikaners in the Cape and the Orange Free State who began to visit Pretoria in large numbers. The President granted personal audiences to travellers and writers such as Olive Schreiner and Frank Harris and wore the knightly orders of the Netherlands, Portugal, Belgium and France on his sash of state. Jamison was jailed by the British but released after four months. The Republic made armament one of its main priorities, ordering huge quantities of rifles, munitions, field guns and howitzers primarily from Germany and France. In March 1896, Martinus Tien Stein, the young lawyer Kruger had encountered on the ship to England two decades earlier, became president of the Orange Free State. They quickly won each other's confidence. Each man's memoirs would describe the other in glowing terms. Chamberlain began to take exception to the South African Republic's diplomatic actions such as joining the Geneva Convention, which he had said breached the Article 4 of the London Convention which forbade extraterritorial dealings except vis-a-vis -vis the Orange Free State. Chamberlain asserted that the Transvaal was still under British suzerainty, a claim Kruger called nonsensical. Kruger and Stein concluded a treaty of trade and friendship in Bloemfontein on the March of 1897, along with a fresh military alliance binding each republic to defend the other's independence. Two months later, Sir Alfred Mulner became the new High Commissioner and Governor in Cape Town. Kruger developed a habit of threatening to resign whenever the Volksrat did not give him his way. 
1897 session, there was much surprise when a new member, Louis Boerta, reacted to the usual pro-offered resignation by leaping up and moving to accept it. A constitutional crisis developed after the judiciary under Chief Justice Kortzer abandoned its prior stance of giving Volkswagen re resolutions legal precedence over the constitution. This decision would have upset the whole country, Kruger recalled, for a number of the rules concerning the goldfields, the franchise, and so on depended on the resolutions of the Volkrat. Chief Justice de Villiers of the Cape mediated, sided with Kruger, and upheld the Volkrat decrees. Kruger was never more popular domestically than during the 1897-1898 election campaign and indeed was widely perceived to be jollier than he had been in years. He won his most decisive vic election victory yet, 12,853 votes to Hubert's 2001, and Skalke Willemberger's 3,753, and was sworn in as president for the fourth time on the 12th of May, 1898. After a three hour long inauguration address, his longest speech as president, his first act of his fourth term was to sack Kotzer, who was still claiming the right to test legislation in the courts. To Kruger's critics, this lent much credence to the notion that he was a tyrant. Milner called Kotzer's dismissal the end of a real justice in the Transvaal and a step that threatened all British subjects and interests there. Krugel's final administration was, Menke suggests, the strongest in the history of the Republic. He had the former Free State President F. W. Reitz as State Secretary from June 1898, and Leitz, who had set up office in Brussels as Envoy Extraordinary in Europe. The post of State Attorney was given to the young lawyer from the Cape called Jan Smuts, for whom Kruger presaged great things. The removal of Leitz to Europe marked the end of Kruger's long-standing policy of giving important government positions to Dutchmen. Convinced of Cape Africana's sympathy following the Jamison raid, he preferred them on this point. I want to thank you all for watching this far. This has been a great series for me. If you're enjoying it as well, please be friendly to the like button. And be sure to subscribe because we are not done yet. Hit the notification bell and YouTube will let you know as soon as the next one comes out. That's all for now, but stay safe and stay strong.